All right, cool. So I am super, super excited um, to be here. So thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. Um, and thanks to Tyler um, for uh, sort of encouraging me and dragging me up here. Um, so this is like my favorite topic in the entire world, um, both JavaScript applications in general and, uh, and architecture specifically. So I've had the privilege of developing single page applications for about five years now. Um, I started on the desktop um, and then sort of like Adobe Flex back before JavaScript was a thing um, that you could really like build these rich applications with. And then I spent a couple years doing uh, Backbone and Marionette. And then a couple years ago, I switched over to React and did that with um, Flux and then Redux sort of more recently. Um, and then if you want to find me, you can find me there. Um, and then uh, I took uh, sort of all of the lessons and a lot of the things that we're going to end up talking about um, sort of in this presentation in terms of... Okay, so then I took a lot of that and these concepts, and then about six months ago, I started building this um, sort of convention-driven framework um, for React um, built on Webpack and React Router and Redux. Um, and so if you use like Rails or any sort of real MVC convention-driven framework, um, I'm basically trying to emulate that same feeling on the client side, but really uh, capitalizing on React and, and um, Redux. So um, that's me. So it's nice to meet you. Um, so just kind of as we move through this presentation, it'll help me a little bit in terms of um, where I might slow, speed up or slow down. Um, who here has actually built an app with React before? Okay, and who's used Flux? And Redux? Okay, all right, awesome. So um, one of the things you're gonna hear um, in Redux, if you haven't already, a common complaint um, is that there's a lot of boilerplates, and this was the same complaint that showed up sort of with Flux, um, that people find themselves uh, sort of repeating the same patterns sort of over and over. Um, I love boilerplate, um, but I think I see it maybe differently than some people do. Um, by the end of this talk, one of my goals is that um, I'll sort of help uh, sort of give you that lens that I see boilerplate through. Um, but what I love that's happening in React right now is between sort of Redux and some of the work I'm trying to do and then um, Redux Saga and Mob X, like there's sort of this real um, emphasis on how do we build things that sort of make us more productive um, so that we aren't like building infrastructure as much. Um, and so uh, this presentation is um, really sort of going to build up um, an application and talk about um, sort of how to use Redux to um, sort of really start to be um, productive and, and solve some cool sort of real world problems. So um, the app that we're going to be building um, in the, oh, you can't see that. Switch out. All right, so the app that we're going to be building is over here on the left. And basically, um, it's going to go out to GitHub, and it's going to fetch the most popular repositories and display a list of the top 10. Um, and we're going to continually sort of refactor this throughout the presentation. And um, right now, the application uh, is basically one component. Um, so we're using jQuery, and we're going to be making an AJAX call. Um, to the Git, uh, GitHub API, and then we're going to get data and set state, and then we're going to be um, sort of displaying that data. So this is there's no architecture here; it's just like a raw sort of React application to start from. <coughs> All right, so this is uh, what we have. Like a simplified version is we have on component and mount. We're making an AJAX call, and then we're taking the data, setting state, and rendering it, and then. Uh, our render function sort of in a simplified view looks something like this. Um, so it's sort of really simple in a sense, really easy to understand. But there's a problem um, with this approach um, and it's actually really subtle and has nothing to do with architecture yet. Um, and the problem is that it's what I call state driven, not data driven. Um, so sort of in terms of enhancing this, how can we like improve this? What sort of patterns can we bring in? Um, one of the issues is that um, when I refer to state driven, it's because this first part that we set, we're saying if uh, we talk to the server and an error comes back, we're saving that and so we're really checking this piece of state and saying, okay, if there's an error, I should render this other thing. The second part might check for non-existence. So sometimes you're gonna check like, does data exist? Does data not exist? Um, you might, and then you sort of imply. So in this case, based on non-existence, this might say, okay, um, there's no data, so that probably means we're fetching data, right? You're like implying behavior based on some condition. And then existence in this case might imply, well, so everything is good if this data exists. Um, so why is this a problem, right? Sort of what's the real issue with it? Um, and the issue with it 
um, is sort of essentially um, this. That when we have components and they get data, so in this case we're getting a post, um, the, the, a lot of the time when we create applications, it's, it's sometimes easy to imagine like this ideal state um, where something might display and this is like the ideal version of it when everything's okay. But data in application ends up having lots of different states that it goes through. Um, so sometimes we need to know if a specific piece of data is being like fetched. So is it being loaded? Maybe we need to know specifically if it's being updated to show a faded out view. Um, if there's an error, we need to display an error. If we try to fetch data and it doesn't exist on the server, we might need to say, hey, the data doesn't exist. Um, so this sort of ability to sort of infinitely express whatever's happening in our data and our applications and simplify our components is what this sort of first phase of the refactor is about. So what I do um, in applications, um, and this works really well for me, and I've gotten bit by not having this, which is part of the reason I'm like really passionate about it, um, is all of the data that I get back from the server I shove in the same data structure. And so if I'm uh, fetching a resource, I'll save the ID. Um, the CID field stands for client ID, and this is actually really critical to optimistic updates. Um, and we're gonna touch on that towards the end of the presentation. Um, but this field is sort of really what it's all about. Um, sort of having this place that wraps your data, this thing you can use, and you can sort of infinitely express anything you need to express. So if you're creating it, if there's an error creating it, like any state, any interaction, gets manifested in your data, components get it, and they can just scroll through the list of states and sort of react accordingly. And then um, I put data in the actual data field, and then in the case where there's an error from the server, um, then you can see like it might be error updating, and then whatever information we have from the server we can sort of display in that error field. Um, and then for collection components, I do the same thing. So there's a state, it's a little simplified, it might be like the, I tried fetching the data, there was an error fetching. Um, whatever the actual data is. And then again, the error might be, um, and we'll see this in the example, uh, you might try to do something or exceed a rate limit and, and bad stuff sort of just happens. Um, so how do you express that? Oops, lost my place. Where are we? All right, so in this case, to solve that problem, um, what I do is I take the actual AJAX request, and to get around this, all you do is when you grab the data from the server, you can just put it in what I'm calling here a payload function, but basically just a transformation function, um, because the only place you really know exactly what was happening with that data is as close to the server call as possible. And the farther you get from that, the harder it is to interpret what actually happened. Um, so in this case, the data that comes in, this is the response that the uh, GitHub API returns. Um, so we have the items, the information we care about, and the number of actual repositories. And then it goes through this function with the state passed into it, and then we end up with this data structure. And what that allows us to do then is if we refactor um, our example, the only thing we changed on uh, kind of the left was we added this payload function. But now on the right, it's a lot easier to actually see what's happening. So instead of looking at if there's an error, if post exists, we can very explicitly say, if the state of the data is there was an error fetching it, or if we were fetching data, or if we were trying to update data, like your components are suddenly very expressive and there's no ambiguity. Um, so, so that's the first thing that we're gonna do in this uh, sort of demo application. Hey Jason, I missed the, like the big picture there. Hi. Oops, sorry. So, uh, uh, pressing the wrong buttons. <coughs> so it's not state driven in a component sense. It's a state in terms of it's like a payload state. It's like what is the state of this package of data? But it's not state driven in that um, the interpretation of the data is based on the state of the component okay. or of like information based on like how it navigated. Gotcha. Just like here's a block of data and uh, so, yeah, does that clarify it? Yeah, I can buy that, okay. All right, so I gotta remember to switch out. All right, so the first refactor, um, can people see that? So the first refactor here, it, well, that's a little too much, is it's the same function, but now before we call set state on our component, we're just passing it into this payload function, which just manipulates the data and converts it into a data structure. And then now we can just say, hey, if repositories.state is error fetching or fetching, or if it's resolved, there's no transitory conditions on it. 
um, then we can sort of very easily um, express that. Um, how did you come up with the list of um, data states? Um, or is it finite? Where is it? Uh, no, it's not necessarily finite. So for CRUD operations, is like the data set I use is typically represented by create, update, delete, um, mm -hmm. uh, sort of whatever, and then errors based on those conditions. Um, but uh, you could also sort of expand that based on um, specific, like not found when a response comes back, it looks, and if it's 404, then it sets a not found state. But some APIs you interact with might say, hey, there's a 403, but um, they'll have, um, especially like larger companies, they'll have individual um, like air codes that are like random numbers specific to their company, but they're very explicit about like what that issue is. And so um, the set I use, I think, is like the sort of minimum, um, but you can definitely expand that out to whatever your application needs. Um, and so this this sort of pattern is really about about that ability to expand that it can like accommodate that. Um, and. Okay, so that's our first refactor. Um, any other questions on that? All right, cool. So this uh, next part. So we're gonna start talking about uh, server communication, right? So here we've got our components and mount function that's making a server call, and then when that comes back, we're setting state and we are um, rendering the result, right? And so, and I think this is a really important question to ask, right? Which is why is this bad? Because in this moment, almost the entirety of the application is contained in one component, and it's super easy to understand, right? So when we start talking about introducing things like React Saga or MobX or Redux or Flux, like there's sort of this undeniable element that they make our applications more complicated, right? And so I think that there's sort of this question of why do we even do that? What problem does it actually solve to do that? Um, and so for me, there's two. Um, I would actually love to have like a discussion around that because I'm curious what people think, but like time constraints. Sadly, um, but if anybody wants to talk about that, I'd love to. Um, so for me, there's actually two issues, right? And one is duplicate logic. So if I have a component, and let's say I want to fetch all the repositories on GitHub, um, sort of for a specific user, I would have that component. And then if I need to fetch repositories based on popularity, that same logic sort of goes somewhere else. Um, and so you sort of end up with that duplication. But for me, that's really only annoying. Um, it's not like this, this breaking issue um, because you can create helper methods or constants. You can sort of alleviate that pain, but it's not like a fundamental issue. It just like is kind of annoying to create. Um, the real problem that it solves is single source of truth. Um, and so what this means is we have a component that has like a list of to-dos and we click on coding. We see a list of sort of tasks to do for that coding list. Single source of truth is about the answer that if you change the title and the component on the left, will it update the title of the component on the right, right? And when your components start fetching their own data, the data is sort of independent. It's not coming from the same place, and so it gets really hard to keep your data in sync. Um, and you can kind of manage it, but it becomes like a real, it has a limited scalability, and you have to have, like there's a high cognitive load in terms of keeping track of all your components and thinking of how the data can change, and like you have to have that in your head, and it's really sort of like buggy and error prone. Um, and especially if your app is real time, like you just can't, you just can't manage it. So the real problem for me that the libraries like Redux are actually solving is this issue of making it so that you don't have to care like what state your data is in or how it's changing. Like you just can remove that and, and remove kind of the cognitive load. So um, the challenge, of course, with those libraries is that they go from simple React component to suddenly you have to learn like five or six new concepts, right? So if you pick up Redux, you have to learn about like actions and a provider and a store and reducers and there's a state and something called dispatch and like. The, this complexity of your application just like, pew, right? Like it just shoots up. Um, so visually, I think it's a little maybe easier to understand um, just to kind of like quickly review to set a foundation. So if you have your application and you're loading some components, um, that's going to uh, invoke an action creator and that's going to make a call to the server and then the server is going to return some response. And that action creator is going to take that response and convert it into an action. And then it fires that and it picks it up by the reducers and they create a new state that they tell the application about and then it sort of updates, right? A simpler representation of that, even like more basic in terms of like fundamentally what that's about is uh, that in our simple example, the Ajax call is basically actions. Um, so that part gets moved into the actions in terms of how data gets uh, fetched. Uh, 
And then this part that's actually responsible for sort of aggregating state is really what your reducers are. So like that whole diagram is just like a representation of moving those two pieces out of your component. Um, so in this case, uh, so if we sort of quickly refactor our simple example on the left over to the right, just to set the foundation for Redux, then our Ajax call becomes this one little part where we have some action we've created to go find the repositories, and then we bind it to the stores dispatch method, and then the part that sets state is this handle change function. Once that's set, the store notifies the component and it changes. Right? So all of that complexity was just to move those two little pieces into like a slightly different format um, to improve single source of truth. So going back to our demo application one more time, we are going to refactor uh, to use jQuery. Um, so now our application still works, but what we've done is we've created this one action that is still just our Ajax call, and now we're dispatching, so we just sort of moved it into a different file. Um, and then we have this one uh, reducer that really just every time that's dispatched, like takes the data, saves it to our state, and then our component is now subscribed uh, to our store on mount, right? So it updates, and then we handle that change, right? So we're trying to do this like in little micro refactors. Um, so we haven't done anything crazy outside of move jQuery into actions, and then even our reducer is really just taking that and feeding it back into the component, right? So, but a slight change, and now any other components we have that need that data will at least get the same sort of source of data. All right, so this is where uh, it really gets fun. This is where I really love boilerplate. Um, so any questions on the, the jQuery refactor in terms of cool? All right. So um, this is the longest chunk um, of this presentation is just talking about the server communication. Um, but this is like so important, um, I think, to applications. So we're just talking about really how does your application make calls to the server and how does that data come back? Um, and how to structure that. Oh, no, this is totally the wrong presentation. <laughs> Hold on. We'll fix this. We'll fix this. Ajax for rev1. That's what I get for not updating a link. OK. So the trick to this is understanding the abstraction tiers that we communicate with between our client code and the servers in terms of really building like an elegant server communication level. Right? So at the root of browsers, they use this thing called an XML HTTP request that is a gnarly monstrosity that doesn't remotely map to like how we think about data. Um, but this is what like Ajax calls more or less sort of look like. Right? Is you like create this request object, you set a type, there's this on ready state change, you open some connection, you send data, you check a response type when it comes back. Like, it's um, kind of a lot of code and not very clear to understand. So on top of that, we take that because that's what we have to use, and we build Ajax abstraction tiers. Right? So examples of that are libraries like jQuery or Axios. That they take that complexity at the bottom and they simplify it. In the case of jQuery, we can just say, hey, I need to make an Ajax call. It's a post request. Here's the endpoint. Here's the data I want you to send. And then when you're done, give me the data and I'll do something with it. Right? Much more human friendly. Um, so. The, the thing is, in terms of why we don't just do that, right, is that uh, REST APIs have special considerations, that they're sort of AJAX plus some other stuff on top, right? So one of the considerations for REST APIs is that they follow conventions, and, and that's sort of a general expectation in terms of the types of requests and what the URLs might look like. And then the second sort of special consideration is that the data that comes back is going to have this ID field, and that's really important to our applications. It's like a first-class concept that we care about. So on top of that, we can build an API abstraction tier to make that part of the communication a little easier. Um, and so one example that I think they just nailed this like years ago was Backbone is fantastic in terms of how they abstract out REST API communication. And so their interface uh, is just brilliant. Um, but it's brilliant for some reasons that I want to talk about. So uh, who's, has anybody used Backbone before? Models or collections? All right, cool. So uh, in Backbone, if you want to talk to an endpoint, you just create a new model and you give it the sort of URL. And then once that's done, you can say, hey, I want to create a new post. I'm going to give it the ID and you just say post.fetch. Right? Like really simple. 
And what it does is it takes that and based on conventions and REST API behavior, automatically says, oh, well, then you want to make a GET request to this endpoint, and then you're going to get some data back from the server. And the equivalent code in AJAX would look like this. Right? So not much difference kind of in terms of code. We're changing the interface. If anything, there's a little bit more code. So then if you want to do an update, you do the same thing. You still have your post, but now you give it uh, an ID and you call save. And it looks and says, oh, it's already got an ID, so clearly you're updating the data. Let me make a put request. And if you don't give it an ID and you try to call save, it's going to say, oh, well, this doesn't exist because it doesn't have an ID, so I'm going to create a post request. You want to create some data. And then if you call destroy, it's going to try to delete data. So um, I mean, just looking at the code, the comparison between like, the left and the right, um, there's a really small code difference. right? So it's, if you were just comparing like, lines of code, like, it's kind of not so much of an interesting discussion. Um, why I love their interface so much is because of the real world problems that it helps address. So the first problem is the unique ID. So when we interact with endpoints, a lot of endpoints um, by default may have this ID field, right? And so, uh, but that's not always true. Some endpoints, even within the same API, may switch the primary key, like reference that they use in the resource. And like Mongo has underscore ID, or especially older systems, you might see a field like username that would be like JC Hansen, right? Like this is a problem that a lot of older servers have and why you can't change your username. Um, so if we tried to create some code, and we had ID, and we said, hey, I'm going to save this data, and then after the data comes back from the server, I'm going to console log the ID, we would see one. But if it was underscore ID, we can't just say post.id, right? Because it's not. It's underscore ID. And now we have to keep track of that in our application, like what's the primary key of different resources. So one of the things that the interface for Backbone lets you do is you can say ID attribute, and you can give it a different name. You can say, hey, for this specific endpoint, it's actually underscore ID, not ID. And it automatically maps that back to the ID field. So it doesn't matter now if it's underscore ID, username, whatever. You can just map it, and then your code stays like real simple and consistent across, across your code base. So I mean, it's a nice uh, sort of consistent ID property. Um, not necessarily like a major thing, but it's a real nice to have, and it's a a kind of a real world concern. Um, so the second one is that when you talk to endpoints, um, APIs, especially sort of ones that are more expressive, um, typically wrap your data with some sort of like additional context and information. And so if we just looked at this data, we can't take this and then immediately use it in our application. We have to extract the part out that we care about. Um, and so in this case, there's this parse method, and it's really useful. You can say, hey, the data that comes back, actually ignore this part. Just reach in. You're just going to grab everything in attributes.data. And that's what I care about. That's where the collection of information that I have is. Um, so that part's really useful just in terms of like parsing different API responses. Um, so you can transform the data. Or if you get the data back, um, and let's say it has like date timestamps, you can cast those to moment objects to make them easier to use with. Um, and so this one's just, it's like generally kind of useful. Um, not necessarily any of these are like sort of killer, like this is really, really painful problem solving yet. Um, but for me, this is like the big one, is API changes. So when we have APIs, and especially APIs can get really, really volatile. Um, and they change, and they break, and the contracts change. You're sort of figuring out what the data model is. Um, and so it might start off that you have an application, and you get this um, response back that has ID and name. And then suddenly, one day, name changes the title. Because they're like, you know what? Posts don't really have names. They have titles. So semantically, let's fix that. Um, but now your application explodes because you weren't expecting title. Your application assumes name. All right? So like, what do you do with that because your application broke? So one option you have is you can go talk to the server guys, and you can say, hey, could you at least not make that a breaking change? Like Maybe keep name and title like next to each other. Um, but you're kind of asking them to do a bunch of work, and that is kind of really weird to look at. Um, the second option is you can totally just be like, you know what? You broke my API or my, my app. Let me go through and refactor everything. I'm going to rename title, like name to title everywhere. Um, or the third option is you can protect your, your application from these types of changes. Right? You can create this sort of protective bubble and say, that was bad, but I'm not going to let you sort of affect me. I'm going to like deal with that uh, sort of at this interface. So um, if you're just reading data, for example, and this is one of the places where parse is like really useful, um, if you're just reading it and the data was changed from name to title, you can get the response that comes back, and you can say attributes.name equals attribute.title. Right? So you create a new resource that's still called name, so it's still going to exist in your data set. And with like one line, your app works again, right? at least in terms of reading data. So um, 
the problem comes in if you're trying to like push data back to the server, right? Because there's two ways, and you just really are using different words now, so you have to sync them in both like coming and going. So the problem with this approach is if you're using name and you try to save it, like if you try to change the title from bacon to bacon is yummy, um, because your app is using name, it's still going to send name to the server, and the server is going to ignore it because it doesn't know what name is. Um, so what you can do to get around that is there's a sync method, and this is basically the opposite of parse, is on the way out to the server, you get one option to manipulate the data before it's sent. So your application doesn't care about this. This is specifically right when it leaves your application and goes to the server. And so you can take that and you can create a title attribute based on name. And then when your response comes back, it'll still have title and name, but at least they'll be consistent. Right? So essentially, in two functions, the API broke and you absorbed it, and your app still works. Right? And then as you get time to refactor uh, and you sync the language up again, you remove the functions, and your application's good to go. Right? So this one, I've worked on some like, really volatile APIs, and it really sucks like, when your app constantly breaks because the API is evolving. Um, so the takeaway here is it really gives you sort of a buffer between your app and your server. Um, so this uh, sort of interface tier is really about that ability to um, understand what REST APIs are and absorb the types of problems that they might invoke on your application. Right, so now we're kind of at the fourth tier. Right? So now we know we have sort of this elegant solution we can use to talk to REST APIs, and we can absorb some of the changes in behaviors. And so now we're back into Redux, and we need to create actions. And this is really where the blue, like the boilerplate gets awesome. So um, actions in Redux are the part that talk to the server. That's kind of where, um, at least from my perspective, that's like where it makes the most sense to put the server code. And so a typical action might look something like this using the libraries that we just talked about. So um, if, in this case, we call actions.post, we're going to create and we're going to give it some data. So this first part here is essentially going to be a backbone model. Right? So we have a few little lines here, and we give a URL root, and it creates it. And now we have a representation that knows how to talk to that endpoint. The second part is when we save it, it's going to emit a post request to the server and pass in the parameters that we gave to create. And then we're going to dispatch. And this kind of gets a little into optimistic updates, but again, we're going to touch on that more later. Um, so this is going to take it and emit it to your reducers to let you know, hey, I just tried to create this thing, like just so you know, uh, and I'll let you know later when it comes back. So then once the response comes back, um, we can dispatch it, and we create an action to say that the data came back from the server, it's resolved now, or if there's an error, we can dispatch an action that contains information about the error. Right? So the cool part in terms of boilerplate is that with the right pattern, this file never changes except for these fields. Right? The only thing that changes is like the name of the thing we call on Backbone, and the action type and the payload state. Right? So this is a create blueprint. This is one that updates data. This is one that fetches data. And that's one that destroys data. Really nothing changed except for the action types, payload states, and the method we called. Um, question. Are you actually using Backbone model in Redux? Is that allowed? Is that possible? You can. I used to. Um, I, but there's a lot of stuff in background that you don't need. Um, so I stripped it down, and what I use, at least for lore, is the exact same interface, because um, I love their interface. But it uses Axios, so it's, you can run it and create server-side uh, tests, and it doesn't have any of the eventing. Um, so it's really a stripped down, like hyper-focused uh, version of it. Um, but the, I mean, they nailed the interface, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, that's pretty cool. Uh, the other, other question I have is, uh, what happens if you have race conditions, like uh, you make two calls, server responds back, but then you get the next call to update post, and they call the reducer in different times. Um, how do you deal with that kind of stuff? So I think we're going to touch on that a little bit in optimistic updates, and we can go into that more after the presentation, because um, that's um, it's a great question, and it can be very challenging to solve. Um, but it's very similar to optimistic updates in terms of that concern. Mm -hmm. Tyler? Mm -hmm. What if I didn't have a model here, like in the code that I've been writing, mm, I don't. So, like, how does this concept still apply if I have some other abstraction, but it's not a focused model? Um, I would say, I mean, it applies in the sense that the sort of takeaway here is um, if you can find a way to represent consistency, sort of across the way that you communicate servers, 
Um, and it's actually really in this next part here. Um, right, so if you, so I'll come back to that in just a second. Okay. Um, so given that there's all the similarity between these things, right, that what that means and why the boilerplate is so exciting is because that similarity, you identify like the pieces that are the same, and then you can create blueprints that you can reuse, right? And all you do is identify what's different. So in this case, if we change this blueprint to take a bunch of arguments, um, we can turn it into a function, and all we need to tell it is like, this is the model that you're going to use, and these are the action types and payload states based on success, error, and optimistic updates, right? So all of that boilerplate just disappeared into one file, and the only thing that stayed was a bunch of constants. And you can tweak these easily to change behavior based on how that action should interact with your reducers. So for your question, Tyler, um, I guess the takeaway here would be that this is really about looking at the pattern, like if you can create one for server communication, and then sort of trying to reduce that um, to, like if you don't have a model tier, right? Like, um, I mean, I guess, is that? It's not MVC model, but it's uh, schema. Yeah. Communicate with the server. I mean, so you could still do it, for example, like with Ajax calls or names or strings. It's more like trying to poke like at um, at this like reduce it down to something that's like the same thing like fine boilerplate in it maybe. So this is interesting because to me what you've done here with the template is remove the boilerplate. That's mm -hmm. what people don't like about boilerplate is that they, in their mind, for whatever particular thing they're dealing with, they can't remove the boilerplate because you have to have it. Uh, and you're littering all over the place. If people were able to go, you know, I can just put that all in some file over here, you wouldn't have boilerplate. You're saying that you love boilerplate. What you're showing us how to get rid of it. <laughs> so to clarify, the reason I love it, and like, so why? Because um, to me, like React and Redux is just an evolution of essentially Backbone and Marionette, right? It's it's different, but it's an evolution because what it did was it solved some fundamental issues in development by challenging the foundation that everything was built on, um, and it created sort of the simplicity. And so what I love about boilerplate is when like, you develop code and your biggest problem is that all your code is the same. Boilerplate, to me, isn't something to hate. It's something to be excited about because someone figured out how to make your app so simple that your biggest complaint is copy-paste. Right? So like, look at copy-paste and be like, oh, well, what's the same? Pull that out and shove something in there that's actually different. Um, so that's the end of that um, chunk of slides. Do, do, do. I did that. All right, we're supposed to go back to our example now. Okay, so to flick back to the example, um, we'll refactor that um, really quick just to pull in backbone. And so you can see that now the same patterns that we just saw on the slides. We're creating a new repository collection. We're fetching it. We're passing in the uh, data that we care about in the query. And then we have the sort of dispatch um, functions that are still payload state. So this doesn't use that last step of actually reducing it to something you can call, but we'll touch back on that in just a minute. Um, so the only change here between the jQuery example and this one is the action got refactored to match that sort of repeating pattern. Um, so any other questions on that before we jump on to um, declarative components, which is where I really start to get excited. Um, all right, cool. So uh, for me, the most obnoxious part in writing single page applications is that you know all these different pieces, views, components, whatever you're using, like they need data. And there's this huge cognitive load, I feel like, in terms of how to express that, um, right? So, and other people are clearly sort of struggling with this issue in their own libraries and finding solutions for it. So uh, one thing you might see is that if we take our component, one pattern you'll see, like especially in the Redux examples, um, is they'll break it up into a component and a container, right? And so now you have two. You had one component, now you have two. But they separated it because the component now is sort of pure in the sense that it takes something through props and renders uh, some data. And then the container is responsible for managing um, the sort of server fetching and setting state, and at the end it just grabs whatever it got from state and renders this list, right? So they sort of broke that logic out, and there's reasons in terms of testability or separation of concerns, kind of whatever, um, right? So uh, one example of an interface that does this, this sort of principle, um, you might hear the term higher order components or decorators is a, is a sort of similar concept, um, is React Redux. 
Um, so there's a connect component that you can wrap your um, components with, and you just tell it how to extract information from state and what you want to pass into props. Um, and React Router recently now has their own higher order component that if you uh, say React Router with Router and you give it a component, it will automatically uh, pass Router into the props of that component. Right? So we're trying to sort of pull this stuff out of components and say, what is the common code that keeps getting reused and how we make it easier for people to write that because like kind of obnoxious. Um, and again, it's the same code everywhere. So how do we simplify that? So um, again, following the same pattern with actions, if you look at this file, everything about this file is generic except for three things. We have to tell it what action we want. We have to tell it what thing in the store in terms of reducer state we care about. And we have to tell it what component that it should actually be rendering and giving that data to. And so if we take advantage of that commonality and we just look at it, we can refactor that into, um, into essentially a function. Um, this is like the decorator pattern, but it's basically a function that returns a function that returns a component. So at the top, we would say, look, this is the reducer that I want you to get state from. This is the action you should call if that data doesn't exist. And this is the component that I want you to pass that data to. Right? So this is the same code, kind of jarringly changed, um, but it's the same code, right? except now it's genericized. So we can take this and we can refactor our component and now we can basically just say something like connect repository up fine this is the piece of state i want and if the data doesn't exist you should call this action to go fetch it and once we do that this container is generic and we don't actually whoops we don't actually need containers anymore right like if you find a way to express that they just go away and suddenly you're like our two components went back into one component with this little sort of decorator thing at the bottom um, so if we flip back over to our example, um, we're going to refactor that to use the same sort of connect object. Oh man, every time, every time, I gotta exit and then switch. All right, so we refactored it. So now we have this. It's still in containers, but it's called connect now, and. Uh, we're going to give it sort of an object and a component, and then it's going to behave. And so our list component now, if we scroll up to the top, we're just going to say, you know what, I want to connect this component down here. Nothing in the component changed except for this. We added this little bit at the top. And I want it to give me a property called repositories, and I want it to pull that data from this reducer and call this action if it doesn't exist. Right? And when we do that, our application still works. But now we don't need a container, and our component is suddenly very expressive in terms of what data it wants. And none of the subscribe to the store, fetch this, fire this action, like none of that exists anymore. We just said, you know what, this component wants this data, do this thing, and we're good to go. So, um, all right, so I got a little bit of time. So uh, if you, so let's take these examples to the extreme, right? Because it, the sort of pattern, the recurring pattern in this is uh, find boilerplate, identify commonality, extract out. Right? And then look at some other place in your code and extract out. So I have a slide for this. So if we look at all those like abstraction tiers, right? So we started with the uh, XML HTTP request, and we said, okay, there's Ajax calls on top of that. And then we need to talk to REST APIs, and now we need to build actions. And we found like a, a blueprint for that. The thing that's really, really, really cool about um, sort of boilerplate and this type of stuff is there's a layer on top that you can apply for conventions, right? That even um, in our example here, right, that if we decide to write our code abiding by sort of certain rules, we could say that, you know what, like, let's assume that the name of certain reducers is going to match the name of certain actions. So there's a map between them, right, that the, let's kill this, the extreme sort of version of taking these patterns and applying conventions on top of them is basically what I'm doing with lore. Um, and... Move this over. So the intent here is sort of to show you like what's possible if you take these patterns and apply them to your own applications. Like how far can you really take some of this stuff in terms of reducing like boilerplate in your in your code base? So if we refresh this, this is the same example except now legitimately it has pagination on the bottom. So instead of saying the top ten, if we click through this, it's going to show this little opacity mask and load the next page of data. And let's click through. If we click through it really fast. There, 
GitHub only lets you call like 10 requests within a small period of time, and then it'll reset like in 10 or 15 or 20 seconds, right? So we're clicking and we're paginating really fast, and suddenly it gets an error, it catches it, and use that data-driven approach to say, whoa, something just happened unexpected. Here's the error, here's some information I got from GitHub, right? So here's the really interesting part um, about sort of, I feel like, taking these to the extreme. If we look um, at the same sort of connect decorator that we built up, using conventions, there's no action specified anymore. So you can just say, you know what, I want you to get this chunk of state from the reducers where this condition is true, so this is adding querying, and I want you to do, send this pagination information, right? So the other interesting part is there are no actions or reducers in this code base, right? All of these things through boilerplate were replaced with conventions and with these sort of building up patterns. The only thing I had to do to get this code to work was I had to create one file called repository to sort of kickstart, this is like if you used Rails before, like you just create a model and like you get a bunch of stuff for free, or like ASP.NBC or Sales does this um, in Node land. So you create one empty file, and based on all of these patterns that get built up, um, I can just create a component and say, you know what, I want you to get those reducers or go fetch them from the server. And all I'm going to tell you is where that server endpoint is. Right? So the entire code base can basically be reduced to just your components just by like, identifying the right patterns for everything else. So this is just meant to sort of highlight, like, if you take this to the extreme, like, these, these sort of patterns and buildup and layers can get really exciting. Um, so that's, this is like why I'm obsessed with architecture. It can be really cool. Um, that's how much time we have. 5.40. Oh, I was watching the timer, Tyler. I didn't even realize we're like 10 minutes over what I thought the timer was. Yeah, I can, I can kick it out uh, now. I'll mention one thing about optimistic updates and then close it out. Um, yeah, definitely really excited to hear about optimistic updates. <laughs> I know how much you like me teasing. <laughs> okay, so um, I will, so I'll, I think I'm going to end up having to leave this kind of to you guys to decide or you. Because I planned 40 minutes, but I didn't realize like I was like. Well, I push this back a little bit, uh, and I apologize to everybody for that, but this is really important. So. Yeah, can we just okay. take a break real quick, or are we good to go? Keep going. Okay. All right. So this is the last. This is the last chunk of my um, presentation. Um, although I will say before I go into this, because um, I don't know if, if I necessarily need to like go all the way through it. Um, so in my like obsessiveness about architecture. Um, if you actually go to Laura's homepage, um, I'm interested in making the framework, but I'm really interested in like talking again. I'm really good at this. Um, all right, so Laura has a homepage at Laura.js, and um, a lot of these things I'm trying to like capture. Um, I mean, I'm interested in like building the framework out and doing stuff with it, but I'm I'm arguably more interested in talking about architecture and real world challenges that applications have, and how do we solve those. Um, and so if you go to the features page, um, there's a bunch of things that I'm trying to build support into for Lore. Um, and Optimistic Updates is uh, one of the things that it handles now. But there's actually this video that walks through an example of what Optimistic Updates looks like. And then there's another video that actually describes it from an architecture standpoint, like how do you sort of build an account for this. And so all of these features are things that, um, like filtering does the same thing. There's a video that explains what it is, and there's a video that explains how Lore actually implements it. Um, under the hood, um, and this is one of the more interesting things. It gets into like your reducers, um, and like removing reducers to me is like the hardest part. Is like finding patterns to like not have to write them, because um, they have a lot of boilerplate too. Um, okay, so that being said, um, the homepage has lots of videos, and I'll keep adding more as time goes on. And now I lost my slides. Did anybody see my slides? All right. So optimistic updates are interesting because they're both um, like really simple and deceptively complicated. Um, so by optimistic updates, what I mean is if you have an application um, and the user wants to create data, right? So we're going to type into the field up there. We're going to create a, a post. When I submit that data, this is about data immediately displaying your application. 
right? So it's not waiting for server confirmation. It's immediately just saying, this is probably going to be successful. Let me show it to the user. Except that because it doesn't technically exist, you'll typically see it with like a grayed out state or something that doesn't let the user interact with it because technically it's not real. And then once the server actually um, uh, creates the data, suddenly it pops into view and says, hey, I'm real now. You can interact with me. You can click on me, like whatever. I have an ID you can use if you need to. Right? And so the sort of core challenge around this is syncing the optimistic update that you saved the reducer state with the real data from the server as it comes back. Um, right? So if our component um, is going to invoke an action creator uh, and we're going to uh, save some data and fire it to the server. Right? And so the trick to this is that you need an ID that you can correlate the optimistic data with the real data when it comes back. Right? So at this point in time, there is no ID for the data because we just made it up. Um, and the CID field stands for client ID. And so this is another one of the things that why I really liked um, how Backbone behaved and why I've emulated this in my own stuff, um, is this ID, every time you create data, every time you create uh, one of these models, it just arbitrarily moves the counter up. So it becomes like C1, C2, C3. If you refresh the browser, it resets to C1. Because these keys don't matter except for the lifecycle of that application. So if we take the CID field and we fire um, an action into the reducers, Right? So the reducers that we have start off in this example with an empty state. So we have uh, the posts that we're keeping track of, and we're going to have a reducer that's going to keep track of them by ID, and that's going to keep track of them by client ID. And the action that we just got um, that was emitted, again, doesn't have our ID, but it has a CID. So our ID field, we're not going to populate that dictionary because we don't have anything to populate it with. But the by CID, we can populate it with C1 um, to say that, hey, this is the data. That we, uh, that we think we're going to get. Um, so then we update our application, and it's real data. Um, so if we're getting like a list of data, we can add that to the list. But it's able to look at that data, and it's going to know that the state is updating or some sort of transitory, like transient condition. Um, and so it's not, it doesn't need to display the actual like, information. Um, oh, yeah, I'm talking totally ahead of these slides. Um, so we can look and say, oh, this data is being created. Right? So the state of this data is creating. So let me show a placeholder post that's going to be faded out or have limited functionality or data. And then the response comes back from the server. Um, so now our response comes back. We get a 201 created. We get our data. So now when we dispatch, because we're in the same scope, um, because we kept this, we can really just sort of take the data that's updated with whatever information just came back from the server, which this time will include the ID. And we have the state that we changed to resolved. And so now when that action gets updated and our reducers pick it up, this is our original state that only stored things by CID. Our action now has a CID and an ID. And so if we look at the CID, we can compare that. And we can say, hey, you know what? This data is the same thing. So not only are we going to add this information to the by ID, we're also going to update the data that we had because the CIDs are the same. So we just like swap the data out. And then our application gets updated. It just gets the same set of data it did. But now the state in that same piece of data is different. And it can update the state. Um, is CID like a no, it's, it stands for client ID. Um, but it's just purely something that like your browser would create. So um, every time you create. Yeah, so when you, whoops. So here, when you create a new model, um, in that creation process, it's going to create a field called CID and assign it a value. And it's basically just a static counter that keeps increasing. So you'll never have a piece of data with the same like client ID. Um, and so, because it doesn't matter, like the server doesn't care about the value, it's just you need to make sure that it's unique within your application. Yeah. So the server really doesn't persist to that change. It just feeds it right back through. Right? Through the browser. Yeah. Response. Well, in this case, um, the server doesn't actually, the server is not getting it because you can't guarantee that like the API you're interacting with is going to like feed you anything specific back. So the CID, because the post is created here and we're in the same function scope, when we recreate our payload down here, we're passing in the original um, post that we had at a higher level function scope, which had the CID that we cared about. 
So the problem with optimistic updates, like the real challenge, is that this approach only works when the data that you emit optimistically is in the same function scope as the data that came back from the server, which is the only way you can really sort of associate the two. If you break that logic apart, or especially if you're mixing like REST APIs and real-time APIs, um, and you have no way of correlating that data, like optimistic updates become a nightmare. Um, so this is like the way that I found to manage them simply, um, but they can be challenging. It's the optimistic part would be like, um, like for a 204, that'd be like a delete request. This might be like the optimistic part would be whether you choose to remove it immediately from the UI or like fade it out until you get the 204 to like confirm it. Yeah. Um, or like optimistic would be um, like if you were trying to like fetch a piece of data and you're showing a spinner, the optimistic might be the spinner that says like, hey, this card, I'm currently fetching it, but the non-optimistic response might be the 404 that says this thing doesn't exist, like I tried. So the um, the association that thanks for that. So the association that I keep track of is just using um, for simplicity um, some of the reducers are objects, and actually that's a pattern I use for all my reducers, even the like complicated like paginated query fetches. Um, but um, so the association is really just that if you take a reducer and you give it a key, it's going to give you the thing back. Um, I don't, Yeah. And I do them in, you know, with an uptime mm -hmm. between the two. Uh, anyway, I don't know why you would. So, no, so that's a really good question. Because, and this is why reducers are um, what I feel is the hardest part of sort of solving this problem, is because, um, like, for example, one of the places I got bit was in that exact same one, right? So I had, um, actually, I think one of the previous slides will talk to it. Oh, I don't want that. I want this. This guy. So um, this was one of the places where I think that exact thing sort of bit me, right? Is if these components are truly independent, when this component loads on the page, all it knows is, hey, I need to go fetch the list of to-do lists that I need. This one, like if your router URL is like list slash like four, this component loads and says, hey, I need to go fetch the list that has the ID of four. So both of these requests are going to go out if these components load at the same time. When the data comes back, you have a list of items that are going to have like different CIDs or an ID is going to match, and you're going to have this component that's going to have a, a sort of conflicting CID but a same ID. And so that resolution sort of really has to be done in the reducers. And that's part of the reason they're tricky because there's like some interesting edge cases um, that you have to account for, and you kind of have to decide like how do you manage that. Um, in my case, I end up doing a bunch of checks with the IDs, and I do a check that says, okay, if you end up having duplicate data, but something already is in there that has that ID, then um, sort of override it with whatever data came second, because I'm going to assume that's newest. Um, but those types of conflicts are, are tricky. Does that answer the question? Is that okay. Thanks. So any, any other questions before we learn about Redux Saga? I'm really excited about that, too. I have not. Um, I like for my own stuff. I want to get to that, um, but it's it's like it's like mobile and some of those like network issues um, are sort of like farther along my cycle of like pain points. Um, so I'm aware of it, but no, I haven't tackled it personally. I've always been like, you're on the internet in a browser. Like I'm gonna make an assumption. <laughs> so any other things I can't help with. <laughs> All right, it's so Redux Saga, Redux Saga. Right. Yeah. All right, and Camtasia.